Right, here's a triple physics higher paper to walk through. It's covering questions on forces and matter, which is SP15 if you're doing the Edexcel spec. The full paper's worth 53 marks. Question 1. The graph in figure 14 shows the variation in atmospheric pressure with the height above sea level. Use the graph to estimate the atmospheric pressure at 3,000 metres above sea level. So there's the height above the sea level. Let's just go to 3,000 metres. Read off from the graph. 70. Kilopascals. Yep, kilopascals. Part 2. Use the graph to estimate the atmospheric pressure at 6,000 metres above sea level. 6,000 metres above sea level. About 47, 48 kilopascals. Part 3. Suggest a reason why the atmospheric pressure decreases with height above sea level. So in other words, as you are lower, the pressure is higher. Right, if you think about it, here's a mountain. The air at the bottom of the mountain, next to sea level, is very dense. And as you go higher and higher, the air is not as dense anymore. So you can see the atmosphere gets less dense, or there's less oxygen, as the height above sea level increases. They're saying why does the pressure decrease with the height we just said increase. You could easily see the atmosphere gets more dense as the height above sea level decreases if you'd prefer. Question 2. Figure 4 shows a container of length 6 metres and width 2 metres resting on a floor. The weight of the container is 15,000 newtons, so that is a force. Calculate the pressure, so pressure is question mark, that the container exerts on the floor. So we know that the force is 15,000 newtons. We need the area. The area is simply going to be that size there. So that's 2 times by 6. So 15,000 divided by 12 is 1,250. Question 3. A weight of 4 newtons is used to extend a spring. So that's a force, remember. The extension of the spring is 0 0.06. Always write down what you know when you know it. Calculate the spring constant k of the spring and use the equation. So let's rearrange the equation. So I'll cover up k, what you're left with, f over x. And that's 66.6 .6 recurring. And they wanted it in newton metres, and that's what it's in newton metres. Part 2. State what measurements should be made to determine the extension of the spring produced by the 4 newtons weight. Right, well there's your spring at first. And there's your spring once it's been pulled. So we'll need to measure that height there. Call that height 1. Measure that height there. Call that height 2. And the extension is just the difference between the two. Question 4. Another spring has a spring constant of 250 newtons per metre. Calculate the work done in stretching the spring by 0 0.3 metres so that's your extension, that's your spring constant. We're after work done or energy transferred because of the same thing. State the unit. 
Well, the unit of work done or energy transfer is always joule, so we'll pop that in straight away. And we'll just use this equation to work out the answer. So that's a half times by 250 times by 0.3. Just double check and make sure that that's in metres and that's in metres. Yes, it is. So we don't need to convert anything. And that equals 11.25. Question 5. Figure 9 shows a 10 newton weight hanging from a spring. One of the forces acting to stretch the spring is shown in figure 9. Complete figure 9 by adding an arrow to show the other force acting to stretch the spring. Well, if you've got 10 newtons pulling upwards, you must have a force of 10 newtons pulling down. Make sure that the size of the arrow is about the same. Well... Try to make it exactly the same if you can. So to be honest, mine's a little bit too long. That looks about right. Question 6. A balloon is filled with helium when it is on the ground. The balloon is released and it rises through the atmosphere. Explain what happens to the size of the balloon as it rises through the atmosphere. Right, well as I showed you before, if you've got a mountain... At the bottom of the mountain, next to sea level, the pressure of the air is high. As you go higher, the pressure gets low. Now, if you've got a balloon down here, the pressure inside the balloon is the same as the pressure outside the balloon. However, as that balloon goes higher, the pressure inside the balloon is bigger than the pressure outside the balloon. So what happens is the balloon starts to expand until the pressure inside the balloon is the same as the pressure outside the balloon. If the pressure is too small, the balloon may get that big that it pops. The higher and higher it goes, it's getting closer to space until eventually the pressure outside the balloon is very small indeed. As the balloon rises, it gets bigger because the density of the air decreases outside the balloon. So the high pressure inside the balloon makes it expand. Number 7. Figure 16 illustrates an effect that can be explained using the ideas of pressure, force and area. Explain why the tip of the drawing pin goes into the wood but the head of the drawn pin does not go into the thumb. Right, let's have a look at the pressure here. Pressure equals force over area. Right there. And here, pressure equals force over area. Now the force is going to be the same in each case. Because this person is providing the force going downwards. So the force here... It'll be the same as the force there. However, you can see at the head of the drawn pin, it's a large area. If you divide a number by a big number, you'll end up getting a small number. So what we've got is we've got a small pressure. Now what I like to see is that the force gets spread out over a large area and that's what creates the small pressure. If you've only got a small pressure on the thumb, it's not going to damage the thumb. Let's do the same analysis on the tip. So once again, the force is the same. However, this time, the area is very small. Now, if you do a number divided by a small number, the number you get is still going to be big. So that's going to be a large pressure. The way I like to think about it is that the force gets concentrated in a small area doesn't get spread out over a large area it's getting concentrated in a small area and what that does is it makes a very large pressure i've actually got a nice little video that i do a demonstration on me son <laughs> a couple of years ago check it out i'll put a link at the top 
Now how do you write that down to get the six marks? Just like this. Okay, I've saw questions asked like that about why is a camel's foot nice and wide. In this case, it's so it doesn't sink into the sand because it's got a large area and the force gets spread out so there's a small pressure. So these questions are always the same type of patter. And the more of these questions you practice, the more you'll realise that. Question 8. Figure 15 shows different water levels in two similar water containers with taps. Explain why the water runs out of the tap of container A faster than out of the tap of container B. Right, the equation that we need here is pressure equals the height of the column of the liquid times by the density of the liquid times by the gravitational field strength. Now the density and the gravity will be the same in both cases. So the only thing that we're interested in really is the height. So if we go from the top to the height of the water, the top of the water, that's height one let's say, and then this one we're going from there to there, so that's height two. So you can see this height is a lot bigger, and if this number gets bigger, it means the pressure gets bigger. Now remember pressure, equals force over area. Now because the area is the same for each of these, the only thing we're interested in is the force. So if the height gets bigger, that makes the pressure get bigger, which makes the force get bigger. So here, basically, this water will come out faster because it's under a bigger force pushing it out. So how do we put that in order to get two marks? Just like this. You'll easily get the two marks for that. You get at least three for what I've said there. Question nine. A student sets up the apparatus shown in figure nine. Part 2. When the current in the solenoid is switched on, the solenoid attracts the iron nail. So the, the nail is going to move down. The spring constant in the spring is 24 newtons per metre, so that's K. The spring is extended from its unstretched length by 12 centimetres, so that's the extension. Calculate the energy transferred, so E is our target in extending the spring by 12 centimetres. Use an equation selected from the list of equations at the end of the paper. So the equation we're looking for is that energy equals a half times by k times by x squared. Let's pop the numbers in. Oh, hang on before we do. That's in newtons per metre, that's in centimetres. So we'd better convert that into metres. So then that's a half times by k times by x squared. Remember to square it first. And that comes out as 0.1728 joules. Energy is always measured in joules. Question 10. Figure 14 shows an athlete using a fitness device. The athlete stretches the spring in the device by pulling the handles apart. The spring constant of the spring is 140 newtons per metre. So write down what you know when you know it, that's K. The athlete does 45 joules of work. So that's either E for energy or that's W for work. The athlete takes 0.6 seconds to expand the spring. So that's time T. 
Calculate the useful power. So we're after P. Calculate the useful power output of the athlete when stretching the spring. So we don't need this yet. We just need that power equals energy transferred divided by time. Pop the numbers in. And that comes out as 75 watts. Part 2. Calculate the extension of the spring. So now we need X. Use an equation selected from the list of equations at the end of the paper. So we need to use E equals a half KX squared again. This time we need to rearrange it to find X. Now how good are you at rearranging equations when they've got four things in? Top shelf. Split the bottom bit up into three bits, not just two. I've got something times by something times by something. And I've got room for something times by something times by something. So shove it in. One space and one thing. Shove the thing in the space. And now cover up what you're looking for. We're looking for x. So cover that up. So x squared would be e divided by a half times by k. Now we don't want x squared, we just want x. So if we square rooted both sides, that would get rid of the squared there. And it would just leave this. Bang the numbers in. So this energy was given to us in the last question. And that comes out as 0 0.8. And that's metres. And it was in metres. Question 11. A student investigates the stretching of a long piece of rubber. Figure 15 shows the apparatus to be used. The student puts just enough weight on the weight hanger to make the piece of rubber just tight. The student wants to plot a graph to show how the extension of the piece of rubber varies with the force used to stretch it. The student adds a known weight to the weight hanger. Describe how the student could measure the extension of the rubber when he adds another weight to the weight hanger. Right. Well, if he takes a ruler and he measures how far down it is at the moment, and we'll call that height 1, and then if he puts another weight on, 1, 2, 3, so this time we've got 4 on, and it stretches down to here. And basically we need to measure that height below the desk. Call that height 2. And the difference in the heights is the extension. So it's similar to a question we had before about the spring. Part 2. The student obtains a series of values of force and extension while loading the piece of rubber and then unloading it. Figure 16 shows the graph of the student's values. Explain how the shape of this graph shows that the distortion of the piece of rubber being stretched is different from the distortion of a spring being stretched. Right, well, if you had a spring being stretched, it would just be like that, uh, linear. So the amount of extension is proportional to the amount of force. As long as you don't exceed the elastic limit, mind. All right, that's the elastic limit there, so let's not go above that. Otherwise, you'll get non-linear extension. This here is non-linear extension, which basically means it's a curve. Now you'll notice as this is getting loaded, it goes up one curve. And as it gets unloaded, it comes down another curve. With the spring, 
it is linear and as you unload it it would come back down the same way as it went up like i say as long as you don't exceed the elastic limit Okie dokie. Question 12. Figure 17 shows a crane lifting a concrete block from the bottom of a deep pool of water. The top of the block is a distance h below the surface of the water. The force on the top of the block due to the water above it is 41,000 newtons. The pressure due to the water on the top surface of the block is 66,000 pascals. Calculate the area of the top surface of the block. So that's force, that's pressure. We're after the area. So pressure equals force over area. Bang the numbers in. And that comes out as 0.62. Remember, one pascal is the same as newtons per metre squared. So you've got newtons divided by newtons per metre squared. That newtons will cancel out with that newtons, and that just leaves your metre squared. And the metre squared would be actually on the top. Right. Part two. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per metre cubed. Calculate the distance h between the top of the block and the surface of the water. Gravitational field strength G is 10. So I've got the density, which is rho. I've got my gravity G, and I'm after H. So the equation that I need is pressure equals the height times by the density times by the gravity. Rearrange the equation. Put the numbers in. And that equals 6.6 .6 metres. Part 3. Explain why there is an upthrust produced by the water in the block. Right, well what you've got is the bottom of the block. If we call that height 1, we'll call this height 2. The bottom of the block is at a lower height. So if we use this equation... Because the height is bigger, H2 is bigger than H1, that means that the pressure is going to be bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. And remember, pressure also equals force over area. So since the area of the bottom is the same as the area of the top, if the pressure goes up, that must mean that the force has went up. So if you've got a big force on the bottom and a small force on the top, that's going to create a big force going upwards, which is called upthrust. Part 4. The crane raises the block until it is high enough out of the water to be loaded onto a lorry. The block moves upwards at a constant speed even though the lifting force in the cable changes. Right, there's the lifting force. It stays the same for a bit, then it gets bigger, then it stays the same for a bit. But when it's the same here, it's bigger than it was down here. Yeah, figure 18 shows the graph of how the lifting force changes while the block is being raised. So, as I've just explained, there's three main sections to that graph. And the question says, for six marks, explain why the lifting force changes as shown on the graph in figure 18. Include calculations in your answer. Right, I'm going to talk about this part of the graph for two marks 
this part of the graph for two marks and this part of the graph for two marks. Now my exam tip is, if they give you units to use on a graph, then you'd better use them. So between 0 seconds and 120 seconds, we've got a steady lifting force of what? Well, if that's 10, that's 11 there. So that's 10.2. Each one of these little squares is 0.2. What's this one? I may as well do this one while I'm here. 16.246810. That's 17 then. <laughs> Now let's have a little look and see what's happening. So the force is constant, then it gets bigger, and then it stays constant again. Let's have a little look at the picture. Right. As the crane's lifting the block out of the water, there'll be an up thrust, a steady up thrust, right until the point when the top of the block starts to come out of the water. Now at that point, as the block gets lifted out of the water, the up thrust is going to get less and less. So the force that the crane needs to lift with is getting more and more. So that's this bit. Now at some point here, the block is going to be completely out of the water. And at that point, the crane needs to support the full weight of the block because the block no longer has any up thrust. It's not being sort of supported by the water, if you like. Now, how do you write that? Well, I'll show you. And we need a calculation as well. Now, we can actually work out the size of the up thrust. Let's do a little calculation. So that's what they say, do a calculation. So we need 17 kilonewtons when it's out of the water. And when it was in the water, it was 10.2 kilonewtons. So the up thrust will be the difference. Right, so there's our little calculation. Now between 120 seconds and 140 seconds, the block would be getting lifted out of the water so the up thrust is decreasing now I'm not going to calculate the weight but let's just bang that in there it might give us a mark for that and then finally, at 140 seconds, the block is lifted clear from the water and the crane is supporting the full weight of the block, which would be the 17 kilonewtons. So actually, we could pop that in. If that's 17 kilonewtons, so that's 17,000 newtons, that equals the mass times by the gravity, which is 10 newtons per kilogram. Let's rearrange that then. So let's work out the mass of the block. 1,700 kilograms. So there's another calculation. And we will easily get six marks for seeing all of that. And I've already put a couple of calculations in, so I'm not doing any more. Question 13. Figure 13 shows a diagram of a device for lifting heavy loads. The metal tube is filled with oil. The piston Y is pushed down with a force K. This produces a force L on piston Z. The pressure exerted on the oil by piston Y is the same. 
as the pressure exerted by the oil on piston Z. Explain the difference between the size of force K and the size of force L. Right, what we've got is the pressure over here is the same as the pressure over here. Well, this pressure over here is force over area, and this pressure over here is force over area. Now you can see, if we rearrange the equation, this force here equals pressure times by area, and this force here equals the pressure times by that area. Now this area here is large, look at the size of it, it's a big large area, and this area here of the piston is only small. Now that pressure there is the same as that pressure there, so what we're looking for is the force is going to be proportional to the area, and this force here is going to be proportional to that area. So because that's a small area, that's just going to be a small force, and that's a large area, so that's going to be a large force. So L is a large force, and K is just a small force. So explain the difference between the size of force K and the size of force L. We can simplify everything I've just said by saying it like this. And that's the last question. So I hope that was useful for you. The more of these questions you do, the better you'll get and the more success you'll have on your exams. Work hard, be nice, subscribe to my channel <laughs> and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck with your exams.